I welcome you all to the business school this, this evening. We are discussing a topic around the uh, BEE and the sustainability of deals going forward, but also the future of BEE. I, I don't think I'm very clear at the moment where the whole policy agenda and strategy is going. So I suspect that our panelists today will be able to enlighten us. The progress that has been made today, if we, if we actually made progress, sometimes we ask ourselves and we think, maybe we don't, we don't know, maybe we've made a little progress, maybe a lot of, of progress going, going forward, and where, where, where are the areas of improvement? So in a sense, I'm repeating a lot of things. Really, this is about the sustainability of the policy, of the strategy, of the, of the whole agenda going forward, and we hope that we will be enlightened by the panelists at that time. For the last uh, 15 years, let us say, and more specifically the last 10, I think what we have seen is a much broader uh, appreciation and acceptance of what it means uh, than previously. I similarly think that it's acknowledged that empowerment is not just about doing a headline ownership transaction anymore. The results of the survey was a consequence of self-assessment, so we have to assume that people were actually overrating uh, the level of transformation and empowerment. So uh, there is, I think, some frustration that we're beginning to pick up. Uh, in society at large as to whether or not uh, the commitment is as substantive and as deep-rooted as it needs to be rather than uh, superficial. It's generally estimated that the overall stock of private sector corporate uh, balance sheets in South Africa is about 5.2 trillion rand, <coughs> plus or minus. If you have to uh, empower 25% uh, of that uh, at a headline ownership level, that's, let's say, 1.2, 1.3 trillion rand. Uh, and general rule of thumb is that about a we're about a third of the way through the process, in fact, is that probably of the 400 billion rand's worth of transactions that have been implemented, something like 200 billion of them are theoretically covenant light, uh, potentially breaching covenants with their lenders or their funders, uh, and or underwater. Uh, so. Uh, probably uh, of the 200 billion, between 50 billion and 100 billion, that's the current estimate, are sitting on banks and financial institutions' balance sheets, uh, where actually they're going to have to see whether or not they have to call in security because the underlying assets are not performing. To the extent that the majority of these deals were done with borrowed money, in due course, the capital that was borrowed is going to have to be both serviced and repaid. <coughs> So unless there is fundamental underlying appreciation uh, of the asset concerned, uh, by the time that the debt has been serviced uh, and uh, redeemed, uh, actually the headline number is no longer 25%. Actually, it's more like 2 to 3%. I think that that's an accident waiting to happen because there's an expectation or an anticipation uh, that actually many of these deals uh, are in the money, they're not actually in the money, and that many of those who participated in empowerment deals uh, are waiting for the proverbial crock of gold at the end of the rainbow. And the trouble is there is no crock of gold, as we know, at the end of the rainbow. We need to think about that. And we need to think about going forwards the fact that probably it's necessary to reshape the debate around uh, structuring empowerment deals so that they are more sustainable and they can withstand many of the uh, storms that we're currently encountering, not only in South Africa, but the broader, uh, broader storms. Mm -hmm. There will be those who say that in the absence of a significant shareholder, so if, if you assume that everybody's got one or two or three percent, that control on a day-to-day -day basis is actually exercised by the management <coughs> team of the company concerned. So my contention would be that it's much better to have a transformed management team who can exercise control over the underlying assets than to rely upon a scattering of individual shareholders. Second example of that, of course, is if you have competent and powerful directors who are sitting on the board, it really doesn't matter whether they represent a substantial shareholder or not. If they speak with authority and competence, my experience is that all things being equal, they will be listened to and they will have an appropriate level of influence over the direction of the company. I think that we have got at the moment a multiplicity of regulation which is causing immense confusion. It is very difficult for people to navigate the codes of good practice, to understand whether or not uh, they are subject to, for the sake of argument in the mining sector, uh, the mining uh, charter and the NPRDA, as well as the recently gazetted code for the mining industry, as well as the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act. 
There's no doubt in my mind that there is huge opportunity, but also the government now, and this is, uh, I, I, I think, my last point, government needs to take the lead in a much clearer manner in simplifying rules and regulations. Rather than considering the macro problem, um, perhaps consider at a micro level, you know, what in our experience we found has worked and what hasn't worked. How do you get this to work for you? Um, and I think the first point to make is that although BEE is a, is a social engineering project um, of correct and appropriate uh, objectives, ultimately the successful implementation of that um, at a micro level is ultimately about core competence. So coming back to, I think, Martin's point, there's no point about moaning about the rules of the game if you fail to understand that ultimately the skills that you need to, to succeed in this are fundamentally hardcore investment and corporate finance skills. It differs, I think, to um, the issue of capacity in terms of BE deals in only one significant way, and that is that the price of failure in sport is actually just very direct and very obvious. Um, if you haven't got the core skills, don't play the game. And don't think that somehow you are entitled to success just by virtue of, you know, supporting the team or, you know, being of the right, um, you know, uh, being of the right gender or, you know, skin color. Um, the fact is that this is a business and the, the wealth creation process fundamentally relies on the fundamental laws of, of finance and economics. So I think the first thing is, I think, I think to say, in terms of value, um, very few people, in my experience, think about the value question hard enough. Um, and listed share prices are very imperfect indicators of long-term value. Perhaps the, the measure, which is a, a minority market price where there's liquidity in the market at the margin, doesn't necessarily translate to the correct price to pay for a 25% illiquid investment, which is locked up for 10 years and ultimately, you know, after paying debt and so on, um, there might be some realizable value. Uh, the second thing that I think people have got very confused about is that they, they, they've often confused fundamental value with a small equity commitment. So they say, well, we're not having to put too much money into this deal, so therefore if it goes wrong, it doesn't really matter. Now, again, that's what we call the BEE option game. Um, you just put a little bit of money on the table, you gear it, you know, excessively, and sometimes it comes good and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but that isn't investing. That's playing an option game. Now clearly everybody knows the most stable source of, of, of funding for deals is if you can put in 100% equity. Um, because you have no financial leverage and therefore fundamentally the financial structures are, are, are the most stable. Now of course in many cases that is a completely unrealistic assumption um, because you're looking at buying big stakes um, by groups which generally have very little equity capital. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that the, the only alternative is going to the third party you know, banking fraternity and getting double flick-flack structures with impossible complications which ultimately make money for the banks and, and very little for, for the BE participants. I would suggest that <coughs> the, the rise of vendor funding, I think, is going to become much more prevalent um, over the next few years. Now, BE might be a shotgun marriage in some ways, and that you've got maybe a slightly reluctant one partner uh, but the fact is it doesn't mean that you can't get the relationships to work. So again, our experience is that where we've done okay um, has been where there's been a very clear commitment, again, a bit like a marriage in terms of the expectations on both sides. Um, and the one thing that we think about a lot, almost as much as the value question, is can we be relevant to that business? Frankly, because if you are buying into a decent business with good management and you can complement what management brings to that business, you're going to turbocharge your returns. So if you're going to make the commitment and you're going to spend all the time and effort to get a deal done, be confident that you can actually add value somehow to that business strategically. And that doesn't mean going and opening doors for um, the other Ching Ching tenders. Um, <laughs> if we were to look at sort of corporate South Africa today, probably a third, maybe a third, kind of get the whole BEE transformation issue. Um, they thought about it. They're committed to it and they've, they might not have all the answers, but at least they're trying.